Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Art as Well. This is your weekly source of connection, inspiration, enlightenment, all these lovely things uh, that we try to do every week with a variety of artists um, throughout Ireland and beyond. Um, this week, we have Gary uh, Robinson with us, and uh, he's from Longford, and we're going to join him there in a minute. Um, but just to let you know that uh, we're taking a break until the 18th of um, January next year. And we're going to return with, we've got a number of people lined up. The first person is the author, poet, writer, uh, Michael Harding. I think that's going to be very, very interesting. And as many of you might know, he is married to the a sculptor, uh, Cathy uh, Carman. So let's uh, go straight down to Longford, or maybe up to Longford, is it? I don't know which, is, which it is. Yeah, it's up. Yeah. It's up. Yeah. <laughs> you go up to Longford and say hello to Gary. Good morning, Gary. How are you? Good morning, Alan. How are you? Good, good. We have our tea ready, yeah? Yes, indeed, yeah. Very uh, good. So tell, tell us about yourself. Um, you, you studied art for a while at least, did you? Yeah, I, I originally studied engineering, mm. uh, civil engineering. Okay. And um, when I, I, I wasn't really sure, when I went to do it, I wasn't in it a wet week and then I kind of realized, you know, this is, this is definitely the wrong place for yeah. me, you know? Yeah. So uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I probably wasn't thinking mm. maybe, but um, so I jumped ship um, and I ended up working with a welder, um, which w w was w was a good experience. But when I was in, in college, I was the, the house I was staying in, there was a guy in the house who was doing graphics, graphic design. And when he'd come back to the house in the evening, his kind of projects were, I, I seen him one evening and he was drawing something in, in his room and stuff. And, and I asked him, what's he doing? He said, oh, some project or assignment. Yes. And I, and I I never ever considered, or it, it never came onto my radar at all that you could go to college to do something mm. like this. Yes. So it was, it was a little bit of a revelation, really, you know. So I, I kind of um, said, God, I wouldn't mind doing that. So I, um, I got a portfolio together and um, I went, ended up in Letterkenny, the art department in Letterkenny. Yes. Doing a kind of a foundation thing where, you know, where you do a bit of everything. Yeah, and it was um, it was an extraordinary year. Mm. Uh, I was familiar with Donegal. My mother was from Donegal, further up the road there from that. But Donegal people are very. Um, one of my best friends, actually, now my, wasn't my best man, was from Letterkenny. Well, was from Letterkenny, so that's where we met. I met my my wife now. My my wife Rosie. She was doing graphics. That was brilliant. You know, mm. you just let loose. Yeah, to to, to, to draw paint and we got photography and sculpture which was just amazing so there was a whole load of uh different things that, that I just kind of was completely into so yeah. it was a brilliant year you know I really so did that painting. get you into the whole area of graphic design initially no it was painting it's what yeah. it was, I, at the end of it I kind of decided well I, it was almost like a decision was made but it was painting was what I wanted to do okay I was convinced of it so I I applied to, I just applied to NCAD mm -hmm. and um, I got, was lucky enough to get into NCAD. So I, I spent a bit of time in, in, in NCAD, but it just, I, I don't know, I didn't really kind of, um, I didn't land properly, I don't think, when I went there, you know, even though I liked the idea of being there and all that, but it was just, I didn't, I think I made, I, like I was saying another time, I was kind of unteachable. Um, I, and I don't mean that in an arrogant sort of a way. I think I was just one of these people that I just couldn't, I couldn't take. Yes. Not, like, not that I couldn't take direction, but I just, I just couldn't talk, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so how, how did you survive it? I left. Ah, oh, well done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I was a bit of background to that. I was playing in a band at the time, playing guitar in, in, a, in a band and yes. like, and I had been doing it on an offer. I don't know, maybe I suppose four or five years hmm. and was very very into it and we were gigging and we were writing music and and that was going on in the background hmm. so um I, I left to join the band yes and so it was it was a kind of a good not an excuse but it was I, I got out of that and got into the band you know yeah and how, how, how many years were you were you playing in the band 
oh, the, the band kind of only lasted for about another 12 months. Okay. Uh, that kind of just sort of just sort of slightly dis- well, it disintegrated. Yes. Uh, we, we all took off into the countryside, rented a house and said, right, now we're going we're gonna to get it together. And, and uh, what we did, yeah. uh, which, you know, that just kind of happens. Mm. Next, um, I didn't do much for a while. Uh, mm-hmm. And then Rosie was doing a, a screen printing course in Dublin. So I moved up to Dublin. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd done a few things in Dublin. It was kept keeping myself busy. Uh, yeah. But uh, painting or anything like it wasn't, uh, was completely out of my, I wasn't thinking about it at all. Yeah. So eventually Rosie and I ended up moving back down to Longford and we set up a business screen printing mm-hmm. uh, called Grey Wizard. And we sort of do sign writing and digital printing and graphics. And uh, I'm still doing it. Um, and, and is, is that sort of the day job and and yeah it you, is you, you, uh, yeah you retreat to your to your studio then yeah the i'm very fortunate the studio is very close to where i live this is the yeah. one i'm in now uh, yeah. i've been here for about six years or something like that so th- this studio is is uh, very close and i come into the studio in the mornings mm. um like i'd be very early in the morning yeah. into the studio and uh i have i've always had a discipline in the studio that's kind of um i didn't mean to have it but i i have a a, a very strong work ethic when i get mm-hmm. in here yeah uh, so i i don't waste i don't have any time to waste you know so even if i'm sitting down staring at space that's still mm-hmm. you know studio time you know and yes. it's kind of but i generally yeah. don't stare at space for too long you know how, how would you describe yourself if someone said you know what sort of painter are you what sort of artist are you how, how would you describe yourself um i i think through the course I, I think about 10 or 11 years ago i kind of found the mark that i was looking for as a painter through a series of drawings or paintings that i had done and they were kind of diary based work it was like i would sort of challenge myself to uh i, I was constantly challenging myself to try and paint the process of a thought and that that, that became kind of frustrating because i, I couldn't i couldn't sort of water it down to what exactly is that you know so then one one time i was in the studio and i was painting and as i was thinking of like from from eye to hand onto board or canvas or whatever it was this was the process so me actually painting was the the process of painting a thought so i I sort of challenged myself then to do these kind of diaries like where it'd be a one minute a two minute a three minute diary where i would kind of it's like it's sort of transactional writing it'd be like um unfiltered uh, writing into can or onto, onto the work, which I have done always. Yes. Uh, with no direction, call, almost like automatic drawing, yeah. Yeah. you know, where yeah. I wouldn't be. So not pre-planned or? Absolutely no plan yeah. at all, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and anything that would start would, without doubt, end up in something completely different. So it was layered, like what I would do would be very, very layered and there'd be kind of a, history to each yes. each piece of work you know like mm-hmm. a journey you know yeah yeah you have three daughters like myself i do yeah and i believe that the, the, you involve them a lot in your work too yes i and do I think we'll, we'll see a few examples of that yeah there i have uh, three daughters my oldest daughter holly she'll be 24 25 mm-hmm. next week and then kia will be 20 in january and then Fela is 13 and they have been uh it's not like they've influenced me but they have but they've been with me through yeah. this and and when i started like you know, i suppose going back to like i never really thought i'd ever paint that mm. was never something that i thought i'd do but when i was a kid i used to do, do small drawings of jcps um and and one thing went on to the next I kind of started collecting Marvel comics. And the thing about Marvel comics, and this relates back to your question, like what, how would I describe myself? Marvel comics were kind of a revelation to me because they they were, they could tell a story through drawing. Yes. And I, I would think that the, the work that I do is a kind of a storytelling, uh, sort of, that my process is storytelling. You know, so each piece would have a story or, or multiple stories in it. So the Marvel thing was, was a big thing for me yeah so I, I would i would say i would be a storyteller yeah um, okay 
yeah. something like that. Yeah. Right. I, I want to have a look at your studio because I find it fascinating. We, we, did, we did have a little sneak before, you and I, Grand but to show okay. everybody else your, your uh, thing. So maybe, maybe if, you, if you tell us what it, where it is and what it is, because that's also interesting. Okay, so uh, the studio is in Longford Town. Yeah. Um, it's a um, two or three minute walk from my own house and it's in a block of apartments. Mm. Uh, and from the outside, it's like a two or three story block of apartments. Uh, they're all two bedroom, three bedroom apartment. But when I moved in, or when I took this studio, I knocked all the walls out, mm -hmm. took out the, uh, toilets, hot, hot presses, everything. So I kind of left a kitchen and mm -hmm. a sort of spare room. And, and, uh, and it was great, like because it, it the studio I was paying I was paying rent on the studio in the center of town, but I could only work there at night, and that was kind of tiring, and I was just fucking wrecked every yeah. day, all most of the time. And then with this, I can work in the morning, and I found out I'm more of a morning person mm. than I am a, a, an evening person or a night person, and yeah. um, and I, it, it was costing me. It's costing me the same. So, so you bought it. Me. You basically bought it. Yeah, I did. I was looking. At, yeah, the, the bank were selling it off at that time, mm -hmm. and, and it was dirt cheap, mm -hmm. um, and and it was the same rent that I was paying for the studio in town, so it worked well, you know. Perfect. Yeah, let's have a look around then. Okay, this is the studio. Yeah, I mean it, it is big. Yeah, it was a two bedroom oh, apartment. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. you can see there on the roof where the the walls were that kind of uh, had it split up, like like it was a, it was a big enough apartment. Okay. Um, this is bedroom number one in here. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, I even have a veranda about or a balcony out yeah. there. Um, uh, this is a sort of a storage room where I, it's not like I don't have enough shit around the place. This is where I put more of it in here, you know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, that there. Um, work tables, they have changed sort of orientation um this is where, how i set them out originally but it's amazing how the energy kind of goes when you have your if, if i don't have the, the benches set up properly the energy in the place gets blocked so i found that this was the best way for me to have have the tables where i could kind of walk up and down and i would move frequently from one place to another yes. so i didn't want to have too much stuff in the way there's my trolley over there super value thank you very much oh yes um, like by. Yeah, it's been, I've had that for nearly 20 years. It's followed yeah. me around like a dog. I see. Uh, yeah. Um, this is my little sort of spot where I just have family shots and some mm -hmm. trophies that I've gotten from friends of mine. Yes. And then uh, I, I started running out of space. So I started, I, I kind of made this clothesline thing here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's handy because I can see what I'm, you know, some of the work that's here. Uh, there's Iron Man and my guitar and uh, my typewriter is here where I uh, I do a lot of typing work or typing or lettering and yes. writing is a very, very, uh, is a fundamental part of the work that I do. There's another piece. Um, and uh, So it becomes and, a collage, does it? You, you use the, the type. Oh yeah, but I, collage would be a big part of what I do and typing would be, I would, and then burning as well. I've started to burn work. Yes. And um, um, yeah, that's, uh, and that's the kitchen. And um, yeah, so um, that's the studio. You, you, you have some very novel, um, uh, what would you call them, um, places where you keep your art. Could, could you show I do. I have, a, I have under the carpet. Um, I'd, I, I like I was saying before, I could have, uh, I'll show you now, this isn't true, I, I could have maybe three or four exhibitions of work, like uh, under the carpet. I love uh, that. Under every carpet. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's under, and then I have, then I have more carpet on carpet, um, and, and then I have more work under that. So I, ha I have work on the floor. Uh, I put it there for a reason, um, yeah. just to get it out of my head, because, I find sometimes when I'm working that uh, I can like there's moments where I would be would be working and uh, I, I'd get so involved with the work and so just consumed mm -hmm. that uh, I have these sort of stages where 
I know what I'm doing is right. I'm 100% focused and convinced and everything is just falling into place. And that could work for five minutes or it could work for half a day. Yeah. And then there's other times, don't get me wrong, there's a flip side to that, like where I could be sitting down and getting up and just slobbering paint onto canvas with no kind of, no kind of uh, purpose. But it's all, it all relates to the history of the work. Yes. You know, this stuff is, is uh, mark making. And yeah, and and, and, and is, it, is it very closely associated with music? I mean, almost like there are uh, yes. notes there, you know, or, or keys of a yeah. piano. Yeah, well, you could take it that I, I can almost uh, like when I when I would be making this work. There's times where I think I can nearly hear it, where it, it almost sounds musical uh, or it could be like uh, a, a, a noise or a hum or voices. I, I don't mean that in a, I mean, it, I, I mean that there's a sort of a sound that comes from it. And I almost have to listen mm. to the work. And there's times where I'd sit down next to it and, and, and almost feel a warmth yes. uh, from it, you know, and it, I find that to be, uh, that's an important part of it because I, I'm dealing, I think I'm dealing with a language that I don't really know what it is. It's a, some sort of a narrative. It is purely mark making, but mm. I, I, I do use text and, um, like on, on this piece, well, on all of them, they, yeah. there's text. Some of the, the, the text of them could be taken out of songs. Uh, I think I'd be more influenced by poetry than I would by painters, mm. uh, and, and Heaney in particular. And there's, I'll just move over to a piece here. I have a tendency to write on the edges of the canvases quite, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So nearly all of the larger works. So you can see on, on this, the side of this canvas, there's uh, a quotation that's uh, from Heaney um, for a second. I have a bird's eye view of myself. And I like the idea of poetry being so instant. Yes. Um, and you can take a word or a line for with you for the rest of your life, you can carry it, you know? And I've, I've just been always been fascinated by this idea that when you, have one letter and you add another letter it becomes a word and then you put another word in with that and you have a sentence and then you have said something yes yes uh, and Harry, I, I see this sort of rather large book there is that a sketchbook we're looking at or, or is it uh, a work in itself this here is these are uh they, I, they be kind of sketchbooks but sometimes when i hit a sort of a when i when i feel like i can't paint Mm -hmm. uh, I, I resort to ink, Indian ink and paper. Uh, and these would be smaller now. I've done, I do normally do this work on large um, uh, newsprint pages, but it'd be basically, again, it's back to that automatic drawing. It's just not thinking about what I'm doing at all mm. and, uh, and, and just making marks that are um it's almost physical it's nearly like if you could imagine it's nearly like doing sort of push-ups for my brain you know it keeps me keeps me thinking in in a non-thinking way i just find them uh, and they do their own thing i just yeah. i just add the ink uh i these a lot of this stuff has been burnt um they are uh, they have no major purpose but i find them i'd read them like a book you know when i'm uh, yeah i'd read these like i'd read a book would you yeah yeah, yeah definitely you know and, and i find them to be very they're almost therapeutic you know yes uh, they're kind of like ink rays they're sort of x-ray versions of of I don't know what. You and know? Are, are, are they, you know, a very personal thing to you? Are they private? Are these things that you might exhibit or, or not? I, I, I don't know. I've not, I haven't, yeah. I, I haven't really considered that with this work. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know. It's, I, I find, I, I find them to be, um, and I'd nearly, not that I'd recommend everybody do it, but I, I think it's sometimes like when I hit a, uh, when I hit a block, it can be frustrating, you know, but then I've over time I've kind of sort of that happens quite a bit. Like and over time, I think I don't get so bothered about it now because I I, I resort to this. Yes. Uh, and um, it kind of fills that gap 
and it's very physical mm. uh, work. They're almost like <clears throat> like on canvases, you if like large canvases. It's physical. There's a physicality to it. But yeah. these are the same on mm. a smaller scale, and um, <clears throat> and I don't really have to do an awful lot. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, um, Yvonne, Yvonne, who's watching, has just asked, can you explain the use of the word burn, please? I think that's literally burning, isn't it? And you burn oh, yeah, paper. burning. Yeah. And I put a match to it. Uh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, the, I've, the alarms have gone off in here. Yeah. Uh, I've had one or two. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I try not to burn stuff too much now at the moment. Um, but, yeah, it would be just burning it. And, yeah. Uh, and, and again, this it all adds to the mm. it, it all adds to the sort of journey of the work, you know. Yes, yes. Um, so w when you go into your studio, then do, do you spend hours and hours there? Do you listen to music? Yes, music would be a constant companion uh, yeah. in the studio. It would be uh, a help a lot of the time. Uh, music would kind of work with me, in, in it it's not like it set a mood for me, but uh, I would listen to different types of music at different stages. Yes. Um, but yeah, music and poetry mm. um, are the are the main players yeah. for me, you know. And and, and do, do you find that the type of music you're listening to, you know, whether it's classical or pop or whatever, ballad, mm -hmm. um, do you choose that because of the the sort of work you're working on? Um, uh, or, or, no. or, or does one influence the other, in other words? I, I would... I kind of go with, I come in, I turn it on. I have a tendency to, and, and I would recommend this, to studio dance, you know, where uh, I would be working and listening to music and then every now and then just burst into a bit of a dance um, okay. around the studio. It's good yeah. for your head, you know? Sure, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, do, do you meditate at all? No. No, you dance no. instead of meditate then. Well, I, I, I would, uh, I think I paint more than <laughs> instead of meditating, <laughs> okay. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What I love about you, Gary, is that you don't try and read too much meaning into what you're doing, and therefore it's true spontaneity. Yeah, I, I, like I was saying before, I, I'm not trying to write anything. Mm. That's, or I'm, I'm not trying to... Uh, Make a point. I'm no, I'm not. I'm not a political painter. I'm, I'm none of that. I'm, I'm, I'm. My statement, I suppose, if I was to make a statement, is that I really don't have a statement to make. Yeah. Uh, As we agreed the other day, that is a statement. <laughs> yeah, that's that'll be it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I, and I'm, I'm not fussy about. Um, I don't wait too long to make a decision when I'm working. Yes. Um, I go with what's the, the, whatever the nearest thing to me is. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of the last maybe year and a half or two years and stuff, I've I've have a tendency to sit down and look at what I'm doing a bit more now, a little bit more considered. But I, I don't think I don't think anybody would really notice that except me. But I yeah. do consider what I do uh, um, more. But it doesn't stop me from st still just going with whatever is nearest and uh, especially with collage mm -hmm. I would have uh, boxes up here where I have uh, my wife Rosie would la was laughing at this I have my this is my filing my filing is like random random and more random boxes just with random stuff so I would literally put my hand into these boxes take whatever's in it out and stick it onto the thing when I'm on the on the move and does, no. it, does sawdust mean sawdust? Yeah, that's actually sawdust. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. All right. Listen, Gary, I, I think we, we can learn an awful lot more by looking at individual works that you've done. So I think okay. we'll do that. So if you go back and, and, and rest up and we'll, we'll, I'll dig out the, um, the presentation we put together. Okay. Grand. All right, Gary. So we're going to look at, at some of your work and okay. um, we'll start with this one. Yes, this is uh, this is from about ten or eleven years ago. This is work on wood uh, or board. It's about two foot square, and it's called a two minute diary. So it would be in that red area. This would have been one of the first ones where I done this diary. So it was, um, and I found like I was saying before, I was kind of, I, I was thinking too fast to be able to write stuff down. So it would end up like more like scrawls. There would be some words in it. 
but it was a sort of a point for me that this is where I I should go forward with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a large canvas. Uh, these aren't necessarily in order now, but um, no. this, this is, I think is about it was about eight foot by five foot. Again, it, it, it was finding this mark and those red marks um, that are there are it was a, the photograph doesn't really do them that much justice, but they're heavily uh, textured um, uh, oil paint um, mm -hmm. that's on an on an acrylic. And they are uh, very, very marked, and um, you know, there's a sort of a there's a feel to them. Mm -hmm. I think there's almost a sound to them, like I was saying. So th this was a, a, another sort of a, sort of experiment, I suppose, in um, in and moving this idea of a narrative or or some kind of text based or uh, trying to to tell story. This is called connected. This yeah. painting, so. Uh, it's about trying to to connect you know okay and you you exhibit um with uh hamley and hamley is that right i do yeah uh with kira and nick um i well, only since the beginning of this year but it's been a massively positive experience um i have to say uh kira is uh very passionate about what she does she is very, very much behind the, every artist that's in the gallery. Um, she has a, a, a very developed program and it's even getting more developed as, as, as time moves on. Uh, she is just, she's just really, really great to work with. And they have a, uh, I'm very fortunate now to be, there's a, a John Richardson French residency uh, award, um, where artists from all over the country kind of submitted work um, and they narrowed it down to 40 different artists. And uh, I'm very glad to be one of those artists. Um, uh, and I seen the show, I went up to see it there uh, three or four weeks ago, a very good show, a very uh, eclectic mix of work, but a very, very glad to be involved. And they're announcing the, the, uh, the three, three people um, will get the residency and they're announcing the, the three winners out of 40 on monday and mm -hmm. uh Aime, actually Aime coleman is one of the uh, he's a, the mentor a mentor so the, mm -hmm. the idea is we go over to france and for for a 10-day period and aim it there that'd be nice yeah and i wish the best luck to everybody in if, it, yeah. if whoever gets there it would be uh, it would be very good for them sure know? absolutely okay let's move on then okay yeah, this is called In a Day. Um, this is an example of typing. It's a small piece. It's only about A3. Uh, it, and, and typing slows down my thought process because you actually physically have to type each letter. Yes. So it makes, you, makes me sort of think a little bit more, uh, more, it just makes me think more about what I'm writing. And this would have taken a day to do it. Uh, and I would be like, I read over this stuff. Some of it can be quite personal. And when I write into, when I write into canvases, I would write, I'm left-handed and I would write with my right hand or I'd write backwards or forwards or up or down. There would be nothing. It's almost a semic. So it would be like something that I, uh, I, I I'm not thinking about, but when I type, mm. it's different. It's clear. Uh, yeah. T tell us about a semic writing because that's um is that yeah. purely sub subconscious writing is it yeah i only to be honest with you alan the only i only heard about a semic writing about maybe a month and a half ago or two months ago and mm -hmm. it was kind of like i almost felt like i kind of found my tribe nearly in yes. a way yeah like, yeah uh, it, it's, it's, from what i can gather well what i do with it is it's it's just uh it's kind of like extreme mark making, you know, uh, you can, you, I use, I would use text. So I would write and it would be words. Or if I'm thinking faster than I can write, it would be just scribbles, really. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's a kind of a, an invitation to a viewer. Yes. Uh, to engage with what I would do, you know, and it's taken me out of the work, uh, which I kind of like the idea of, 
you know, taking the, the artist out of the work, even though I'm, I'm making the work, but it's, it just gives <coughs> people um, an invitation. This is called uh, Holly's List, my uh, oldest daughter. Um, like I was saying earlier, they, they are very, you know, they're they're very much in what I do. Uh, this is a collage. It's only it's a small piece of work, and it has a, a, a list. When Holly went to college first, she wrote a, a list, shopping list, um, of stuff she had to get, mm-hmm. like a food shop. And I got I have uh, copy books that they don't have from when they were at school, uh, and it's going still going into the work. So this this was a piece of work that I um, started using lists that would be sort of peppered around the house um, yes. I've done I've done quite a few of this type of work yeah. and uh, so just, that's how, how the kids get involved <laughs> very much so and then they get involved actually physically painting you Do know they? oh yeah right. I just knock stick it in there and knock yourself out just mm-hmm. uh, you know there's no uh, there's nothing uh, sacred or there's nothing precious about this oh, yes. well, what you yes. do, it's rough and ready and uh, yeah, I've invited other artists to work in my work. Oh, have you? you know? Oh, right. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of collaboration stuff. I've done it with Dave Newton and Thomas Bresing, where we would um, uh, just write or paint onto work that I have here, you know. So I, yes. I wouldn't be, um, I'm not terribly precious. No, no. Uh, this is a, a, a scattered memory woodblock. Um, uh, my one of my daughters um, had a kind of a slight concussion. Uh, a lamp fell on her head, and uh, gave her a bit of a bang. And this is called head bang, um, and it was uh, done around that time that Kia kind of uh, had got this concussion. And these are these are onto hardwood blocks that I found in a, in a, a factory that makes windows here in Longford, um, and they're about the same size as a, as a book. They're about yeah. eight by twelve, and when you knock on them, it's like knocking on a door. So there's a sort of a, uh, it's like a, it's like if you knock on someone's door, there's a sound. Yes. Like, yes. Not, and it sounds like a front door. And then, <clears throat> you know, you nearly expect the door to open. So there's a kind of a, very much uh, an openness to this work. Yeah. This is actually one of the pieces that, that uh, where I, uh, Thomas Bresing worked with me on this one. It, it wasn't a plan. We just kind of went to it. But this is called How to Interview a Painting. Um, I was on a, a residency down in Anna McCarrick and I had set, I, I got a really big studio, so it was great. And I, I set well, a, bit, a large canvas up on the wall that I had started work with. A, a friend of mine had told me, when you go down to Anna McCarrick, don't try to finish anything, start something new. So I thought oh, that's what I'll do. So um, I had set up a desk in front of the canvas with all my paints on it and, stuff, and, and the typewriter. And I was moving over and back from the desk to the canvas, desk to canvas. And then I sat down and I was sitting down in front of the typewriter and it was like as an, an, an interview, like as if I was interviewing the painting. So I thought I'll, I'll interview the painting. And I did. Yes. It would be a series of questions mm-hmm. that's in, in this work here. Um, and it would be, so are there other questions in the work? Yeah, the questions oh, okay. are in. Yeah, there's 10 questions. And they would be, you know, asking the painting more or less, who does, who does the painting think it is? Why is it here? What is it going to do? Have, does it have a purpose? Mm. Um, you know, and then there'd be some silly things as well. But uh, I've done this quite a bit now, actually, this interview painting, how to uh, interview. And then I've I done one where, I was actually interviewed by a painting. Mm-hmm. Mm. It reminds me of a story that Eamon Coleman told. He had a rake of paintings, abstract paintings, all over the wall, and somebody said uh, to him, "How do you know when they're, uh, you know, when you're finished?" And he said, uh, "Oh no, they they talk to me." Yeah. And and he yeah. said, "Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah, but but how do you know when you're ap- actually finished?" And he said, "Oh, when they start talking to themselves." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, there yeah. you are. I, th- I thought you'd understand that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, never mind your man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. Lovely. That's yeah. very colourful too, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it's it's about uh, what is it? It's about two foot by one foot six. It's a combination of, again, it's the nearest thing that I have. Uh, there's collage. There's 
I'm not fussy about brushes or uh, I'm not fussy about material. If if or, or it's the nearest piece of paint that I have yeah. to me that I will do, and I would do it without thinking uh, yes. too yeah. much. You know. Okay. All right. So this is actually the painting that I interviewed. Um, that was in front of me in, in Anna McCarrick. This is called Big Questions, Big Answers. Um, and it was, again, it's back to this mark uh, that that is, is, is saying something. I'm sometimes not even sure what it would be. Uh, and then there's times where I don't really, I'm not really bothered. I just, I, I would just paint for the sake, the sake of actually painting. Like it's the, the physical act of moving paint mm. um, and writing into paint and then painting over it and then doing it again yes. and then getting things right and wrong. And going back to what I was saying before about when you get into that moment where you're just at it and it's just nothing can stop and nothing matters. Uh, and then there's times like where that stops and you can't do anything at all. This happened with this painting. Yes. Yes. Um, do you know what I, what, what I really love, Gary, about what you do is, is that you, you give people permission yeah. not to have to think about what they're doing, but just do it, whatever, whatever occurs. Um, you know, and, and I love that sort of permission idea. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't, it's not, in, this isn't entirely about the painter, the effort mm -hmm. for me. It's not, a, this isn't really about me as an artist. It's about, I, I, I'm making the work, but mm -hmm the work has something to say like i mean i'm not unusual in this now but i i would i i i believe that the work has something to say and that if you listen mm. close that you know you just might hear it. that that's for me now as well yeah. you know I, I wouldn't there's no difference yeah i wouldn't think okay this is a story this is called lost in jerusalem uh, or when i was a kid yeah you I lived had, in the middle east for a while did you I did, yeah. I lived in the Middle East when I, I my dad was an engineer, so we went there when I was about, I was about uh, nine or ten. Uh, I wasn't too happy about it going there at all, but um, wasn't really my decision at the time. So no. um, you know, uh, even though I did protest, but um, it was a great. Uh, we were there for three or four, two, three or four years or something like that, and. Um, it was uh, very much uh, an experience that has, has stayed with me. I was, uh, we were kind of in a compound with other Irish people and uh, very much kind of uh, cocooned in a way, mm -hmm. um, even though we were living in the middle, literally in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, so I was very much left to my own devices. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was around this time that I thought I could fly. Um, uh, I can't. Is, that, is that how you got lost in Jerusalem? Lost in Jerusalem was, uh, it, 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 yeah, kind of. We, I, I literally got lost uh, in Jeru Jerusalem, much to my mom and dad's uh, a complete horror. Yeah. In the old city, uh, I uh, I took off and um, I was gone for a few hours. Uh, I ended up in this Franciscan church where the, the there was a choir practice uh, going on in this church in the middle of old Jerusalem. And uh, I'll never forget it. Mm. Uh, it was it was just an incredible experience. And you, you were oblivious to your, your parents' trauma. Absolutely, completely oblivious. And <laughs> up in the left-hand corner there, there's mm. a, a piece of... Um, uh, it's like a prayer card, is it? Yeah, from, from Jerusalem. And now for something yeah. completely different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I took to burial work uh, there with, uh, with, with Thomas Bresing and Sean Cotter and I had an exhibition in, in Galway for the Arts Festival uh, a few years back. And it was to do with memory. And part of the what we done for the exhibition was that we, we buried that this photograph is is, is from the, the Burren and College Burren, Burren but the, we've done the same thing there. But in, in Galway and in the Burren, we buried work and yeah. uh, that there the box that I have there was a memory box um, that we had in Galway where we had asked people to write messages uh, of good memories or bad memories or whatever mm. just, and, and to put them into this box. Um, so the memory box was buried, uh, artwork was buried, I buried book, 
Uh, and then 18 months later, we retrieved the work or what was left of it um, out of the ground. Mm -hmm. and almost giving these memories or whatever a sort of a second a second chance this is a book that was buried i buried this book um and that was very interesting to see so we exhibited this as part of the the consequence of memory was the name of the exhibition we we exhibited this with the clay and earth and everything the yeah. whole lot in the center of the gallery yeah yeah this kind of goes back to the the use of text, I I um I love the way like this isn't a, a poem that particular thing, but the way in a book of poetry, the way poetry a poem is kind of set out in a page, it's just so so, so much structure, and and when you hold it up to the light, you can see the poem on the opposite page. So I like this idea of text mixing up itself. It's like the text that I would write into into my work. It would be. Uh, mixed up a lot of the time um, and you have to sort of work to mm. see some of the words so so this is this is a, a just an experiment really um, mm. one of many um, that I would be doing in here and that is was, I just stuck it up in the window and I, I just sort of covered it with linseed oil so that it has this kind of glow to it yes and, yeah uh, translucence or whatever yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay this is um this is very close to my heart, this paint. This is called Letter to My Daughters. It's, it's a large piece of work. I suppose it's about eight foot by five foot. It's um, gesso and ink and sawdust and pencil. And it starts off as a letter, literally, to each one of my daughters. Mm. Uh, and as like each one of them would have a paragraph. Uh, I'm not even sure what I was saying in it, but um, I don't know for sure if each mark is a letter or a word, but I know at the time that um, this was a heartfelt letter. And it came from, uh, my father died in 2014. And after my dad died, uh, my, my mom gave me a letter that I had written to my dad when I was seven. Mm. And it was basically, uh, I, had, I was saying to him that I was being good and uh, that I wanted him to buy a toolkit. Uh, and I had even drawn the money for him, uh, pound notes yes. that were in, in the letter so that he could to buy it. To pay for it, you know. Lovely, yeah. Um, but at the end of the letter, uh, I said to him more or less, and I said, really, Dad, all I want to do is give 20 kisses. And um, that's really all. Because my dad worked away a lot. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, when, even when we were in Ireland um, yes. and at the end of that painting, there's 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 20 kisses. So it's, it's, that's a very personal piece of work. And I've done work like this before and since. And I have it here in the studio, like you know, with, yeah. with these letters. And they're, they're kind of important pieces of work for me. You know? Yeah. You obviously had a very good relationship with your with your dad. I did. Yeah. Um, this you know, my dad was. Uh, was a quiet sort of a man um but he he was uh, very good at listening and i would waffle on about art and whatever whenever he was here mm -hmm. and he would uh, he would listen and and that was that was great and this and, and when when he died i was i was uh, the grief was was uh, i wasn't expecting it and when he did actually die he was, we were all there, my daughter and I and uh, other family members uh, were in the room with him when he died. And when he died, not too short, not too long after, I put my head on his forehead mm -hmm. and uh, kind of said goodbye. And, and that's, I'd done a series of these drawings mm -hmm. saying goodbye to my father. Um, and that's, that's one of them. That's what we're looking at now. Yeah. That and is, is there a sort of a poem below it or just words? Related, it would be just text. Yeah. And, uh, again, it would be uh, uh, kind of unfiltered. Mm. Yeah. Uh, text, yeah. you know, and, it, we, and we, this would be different from a lot of the stuff I do because that would be very quick draw, very very quick. Did your art um, help you through your grief? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the, um, after my dad died, my mother became sick. 
and uh, like very very quickly after dad died so there was no real time to grieve mm. my dad yeah. we kind of had to focus on the mother so that and then my mother uh, my mother passed away then in 2019 so the, the whole the grief thing came at me from out of nowhere uh, uh, I was I was kind of expecting it but I didn't expect it to hit me so hard mm. um, and I think grief is a is an experience that is almost bespoke everybody has their own version of it and people deal with it well or they deal with it in whatever way they are built to deal with it uh, I I took it into the studio yeah um, I felt like I was walking around the place with a bag of coal mm. a lot of the time uh, sort of sad coal and I and I take out this coal and I throw it into the fire and the fire would get bigger and I'd get more kind of clogged with this weight and and then out of nowhere earlier this year my a family all of us went down to Wicklow and we were on a walk uh, which we hadn't planned and uh, it was a, one of the coastal walks and we were followed by a seal and it was very it was a beautiful day and a beautiful walk and. I, I came across this well um, in a in a kind of a hedge with a mm. tiny little sign, uh, uh, really on the on the on the edge of this cliff. So I went down into it, and it was more like a puddle than it was a a well. Yes. And on, I didn't expect myself to be doing this, but I started to wash my hands, and I, I'm I'm not, uh, I wouldn't be a religious man or anything, mm -hmm. but I started to wash my hands. Uh, I washed my face, I started to wash my hair. Uh, this all happened in the space of about two or three minutes. There was nothing mm. more than that. And, sure. and when I, I left it and I felt, I almost felt lighter. Um, and I had, I, I feel and felt at the time that I had, I had left my grief mm. at this well, because the grief was following me around. It was like a bruise, like a wandering bruise. I had no where, no idea when it would come up or when yes. I would, notice it so it was very uh, you know it was kind of unforgiving but I, I felt like I left it at this well so and I've started to do work on that um, on that sort of moment uh, mm -hmm. it's not like the grief is gone but it is I don't I'm not, I don't have that bag of coal and, you know, it's very, very interesting that that should happen um, apparently there are there are 3,000 um sacred wells or not not necessarily sacred some some would be considered but yeah, um, all, some of them all. actually do have properties this um, one they yeah. do yeah and some of them can be like you know they have they would have cures for one thing mm. or another but right. and, and a lot of the time on these wells i think they would say that, that this one could be a cure for uh whatever well, but depression there's, there's yeah. one that i happen to know about yeah yeah but this particular well that i had they had the name of it i can't even remember what it was on this tiny little sign and it said uh, cure uh, unknown <laughs> yeah so i thought well i know <laughs> give it a lash anyway yeah I know, you know very good uh, yeah but it was it was a good thing that's good well i'm i'm, I'm glad that helped yeah. you meet. yeah it did and uh, this is a work that i've done about my dad um uh it's called trying to get up. I've done a series of these, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad was—he was a quite a tall, strong man, and he had, he had cancer, and it, it had—he couldn't get up towards the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and this was—I used to watch him trying to get up, so it was kind of heartbreaking stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But again, this is storytelling, and I am not the only one uh, who has experience this but this is is i'm just telling my story you know sure yeah or his. this one is from my mother my about my mother after mm -hmm. she had died i found pieces of paper in her room and on the top left hand corner there's a piece of paper and she had written on it it's not the leaving of liverpool that grieves me. and i thought it was a curious thing mm. this thing called liverpool and I was, I was a curious thing to, to say, like, you know, it's not like something my mother would say. Yes. Uh, but it was her handwriting. Yeah. Um, so that's always a puzzle there. There was, but then I checked it out and it, it was, it, it's a song, uh, the title of a song. Hmm. Uh, 
my mother and father were, were very keen dancers and uh, and very good from by all accounts but um uh, yeah it's it's a it's an old country and western song i had found that out after i made the piece but it goes back to the idea of hearing hearing a painting yes again now this is uh a lot of the times the, the work I would do in the studio would kind of almost require installation work. Uh, it's something I couldn't paint. Um, mm. So I would resort to, in this case, uh, footpaths. I started collecting footpaths. Uh, I had a, I kind of had maybe three or four of these guys and they're about half ton yeah. uh, in weight. Um, but I was intrigued by them because they're almost like a document. Uh, and they have a pattern that they, when they lay the concrete down, they roll a, a, a thing called a paddy roller, paddy pattern, something or other, but it, mm -hmm. it leaves the pattern on. So it's almost like a code. Yeah. Or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or again, like a narrative. So I, I would take words that these, the, this piece would have been surrounded by single words that I, that I would hear uh, when I'm walking down the street. Yeah. Uh, I could collect snippets of stories. And you, the idea was that you stand up on it and you're elevated, uh, mm. which is an unusual experience. And yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoyed doing that. Okay. It, this is the underside of, of a footpath, which again, the footpath being the surface and then underneath that, you have this impression of wet concrete that's been made on the earth. Mm. that is the opposite of this flat surface so and almost like a portrait in a way uh it's like what you when you meet somebody and you see their face so you see them in front of you that's what you see mm. but underneath there's you know there's many things quickly what this is i was uh, had a show uh with noel in, in the, the origin mm -hmm. yeah um and i i don't know if i'd meant i, I Noel kind of took me in out of the dark in, 20, in 2006. Somebody uh, had said I should send some work up to Noel, and um, uh, I didn't know her at the time. And I sent the work up, and she said that she liked the work. Would I come up and meet her? So I went up to the yard, and she was on Harcourt Street at this at that stage. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I, um, like I say, I didn't know anything about Noel, but I got on with her immediately, straight away. I just sensed her energy. I just liked her vibe she's been a great supporter of what i've done um and uh noel and kira kind of remind me of each other that, that they remind me of uh this energy that you have to have noel would have been behind artists as well uh, and and kilrelig which is uh, an incredible place to to get to um uh, and through one of the exhibitions i had in noel's place some this woman gave me a series of diaries uh, from her husband's uncle mm -hmm. who had passed away and uh, there were tiny, tiny little books and each page started off with a reference to what the weather was and then he would describe mm -hmm. what happened that day yeah. and uh, it was um, uh, it, it was almost like I, I was getting I was inside this guy's head mm -hmm. and that piece of work on the left hand side there is uh, the frame of an underneath of a bed that I used to clean my brushes on. And I was looking at it one day thinking it's lovely looking color. So yeah. uh, colors. So I got one of your, uh, this was again, one of these quick things I hadn't meant to do it. Took out this book of this little diaries and started to write, uh, transcribe more or less the text onto, because it has a line page formation to it. It's like mm. a copy book. Yes. And, yes. And it describes, it's called 1973, and it was taken, I, I accidentally had started in January 1973 and worked my way through to December 73. And he describes uh, in that, it's a story again, he talks about his car, he talks about depression, he's, uh, he talks about, he had suffered from depression, and he used the diaries, I think, to kind of help him mm. um, with this. And I found them very helpful to read. Uh, yeah. And on, on the right hand side, then, is text that I would have heard other people saying when I was walking up, uh, down the street. So yeah. I thought there was a kind of a, uh, a balance between something that is completely personal. And then on the right hand side, these found texts, almost like Polaroid of texts or conversations of mm. 
random people uh, that I don't know uh, saying things that are in some cases profound without even knowing it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you just picked these things up. Like I was expecting the priest to call, but I forgot he was dead. Yeah. Just going to have to change your lifestyle, start a new life. And you can, you can actually see that happening, walking down oh, yeah. Grafton Street or somewhere, you know? Yeah, it's, um, there's, a, there's one of the quotes there mm-hmm. where a man says, at this stage, I'm just thinking of dying. Uh, and, and these are amazing things. Mm-hmm. And they're all individual. They're all different people. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who they are. And everybody can experience that. Yes. Again, this is a collection of sticks that I had. I gathered an installation stuff again where I was kind of trying to invite people to say something in an art piece, uh, but nothing to do with the artist. So I had led, left these tags, these paper tags, and asked people to leave messages on it. And uh, they did. Uh, I'd done this in uh, in Longford. I'd done it in Armagh. I'd done it in the Luan, in Athlone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the messages, some of the messages were, um, they were I, don't, I don't know who they were from, but yeah. they, they were all very, some of them were massively personal. Yes. Uh, and other ones were kind of, you know, jokey stuff but it was it was an, it was more like an experiment yeah. but people people would leave this piece of work thinking that they had they had they were part of it so i like that idea. idea yes you know, this is a nice idea yeah this is the text thing again where i took a body of text projected it onto a series of uh net curtains and, mm-hmm. uh, and i had a fan in that room so that the net curtains were floating with the fan m- mm. making them float and the text was being distorted the first the whiter piece there the first sort of sheet the text is clear but as it goes through the series of of sheets the text became completely distorted it was just an, again experiment yeah. right gary we leave it there that that's that was a great insight into your sort of work and and you know from installation to painting to all sorts really yeah, yeah. It's, it's mixed okay. um I'm going to see if anyone would like to ask you a question. Empty handed leap into the void, says Tim. Uh, do you have a website, Gary? I don't, actually. Uh, do you no. not? No, I know I should. I should have. And uh, oh. um, But you have an Instagram, do you? I do. I have an Instagram. Uh, what's your handle on that? Uh, it's um, Gary Robinson French Hall Studio. OK, we'll put that in the um, the video. Yeah. Any links great. to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would um, be great. Ruth says, genuine and humble man, unaware of the wonder of his work. Thank you very much. I... Yeah. And Tim says, yeah, there's, there's, there's loads of different um, uh, cures, you know, in, 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 in these um, uh, holy wells. Um, Tim says, a well in Terry Glass has a cure for blindness. Yeah, you know, they're all over the country, you yeah. know. Um, all over the country. <clears throat> Annie Hogg says, I'm down in Kilreely right now, last day. Oh, a brilliant, oh, a brilliant place. And uh, it's lovely. Tell, say hello to Noel. Uh, I know she's down there. It's it's uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a special place. She'll be watching this later on, I suspect. Uh, Wilma says, uh, loved it. Would like to see more. It's good. Malachi, thanks, Gary and team. Alan, another great episode. Thank you. Uh, Annie says, will do, as in she will mention that too. Very good. Um, yeah. Violet says, brilliant. Thanks, Gary and Alan. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, Alan, I just wanted to make a comment, if that's okay. Yeah. Sure, of course. So, yeah, work away. Uh, yeah. So, I, I know Gary, and he's a remarkable man. And like you say, very humble. But I don't think he realizes just how special he is. You know, it's, it's pretty incredible what he does. Um, there's a quote from Kandinsky that's relevant here, where Kandinsky, um, you know, who invented non-objective art in the early 1910s, he's basically saying that artists who are get no satisfaction out of depicting what they see are envious of music. And what I find beautiful about Gary's work is of all the artwork that I've ever seen, I feel like his work most jibes with Kandinsky's point that Music is different than art, but Gary's getting closest to music that I've ever seen. So it's remarkable. And I'm delighted to know him. And you're amazing, Gary. Keep it up, man. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, congratulations. Um, oh. I just wanted to show you something that I think talks about 
the universality of what it is you're doing. Behind me, if you can see, if I can hold the, the painting up, can you see that? Behind me is a painting yeah. by uh, an American artist called Grace Knowlton. Okay. And Grace Knowlton sadly just passed away this year at the age of 88. Oh. And Grace Knowlton would make a whole series of what she called subconscious mark making. Oh. And one of the things that she did was she would either put the, she, she puts the paints the painting or the plate when she's making a print in front of her. Okay. Okay. So she is working blind. So the painting is sat in front of her with its back towards her. Okay. And she literally dips her hand into the paint pot yeah. and draws without knowing what it is she's drawing. She's just making marks. I think that's a great right? thing to be able to do. Like, yeah, because it's a surrender. Um, to surrender the, the process. But one of the interesting things is that when Grace started doing the, the research into what she was doing, it linked into the whole notion of automatic writing. Yeah. And, and Grace Knowlton did a whole series of works with um, uh, the beat poets of, of America, who are very much related back to the whole idea of spontaneous poetry or, or um, automatic writing of some 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 description yeah automatic writing is regarded as one of the beginnings of abstract contemporary music making oh. so what i'm saying is you're linked in that circle right into that whole process it's, and it sounds familiar that that what you're saying yeah. thank you very much yeah but what i'm what i'm what i'm saying is that this is only starting to happen which is very ancient it's only coming to the surface in Ireland now. It has been, you know, we, we've had this process in America, we've had this process in, in Europe since before the Second World War. Now it's happening in Ireland, but it's happening in Ireland in a very unique way with that link to our, our, our I suppose, our poetry past, our written past. So just to say congratulations on that. Thank you very much, Eamon. I just opened the show down in Hamley and Hamley for the Hark exhibition. And your three pieces on paper that are in the front gallery are probably some of the best paintings that I've seen in 10, 15 years. So I, yes. I genuinely well done. Right, thank you so very I much. I just wanted to say congratulations and uh, yeah, pat on the back. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks very much, Eamon. You're very kind, you know. Thank you, Eamon. Yeah. And I, I, I love what you said there. It's very pertinent. Um, Maura Finnegan says, love Gary's work. It feels meditative, ritualistic, like saying a rosary or a repeated mantra. Are you a bit of a conduit between here and the other? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, Seamus Heaney, the, a, a line in one of his poems uh, was, um, between uh, here and there and now and then. And uh, I have that actually written on the side of one of the works, actually. I think it's up in Hamley and Hamleys. Yes. And it, it, it uh, I think Heaney might be more uh, conjugal there than I, you know, I think, uh, uh, and many poets, like I was saying earlier, poets have, um, I think there's an extra special thing with somebody who can write something Mm. Uh, in in a single line. Jacques Descotto over in Canada says, there was a movement stroke group of artists in Canada in the 1940s and 50s called Automatists. Automatists. Oh. Are you aware of that? No. no. Okay. Uh, Margie Dunn says, many thanks, love the installations. Thank you. Kira, you go ahead, please. Yeah, I just want to say as briefly as I possibly can, um, that Gary's work really is totally unique. And when you see it, it really does get inside you. Um, it's something very, very special that he's doing. And quite honestly, his work has sold like hotcakes since we've represented him. But every time a piece leaves, I feel, I feel a little bit of sadness because his work is so special. 
And I just want to say, Gary, it is an absolute privilege to have your art hanging around this gallery and house. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And, and you. you're so you're so right. You know, showing pictures on a small screen like this, you have no concept of, of what it's actually like in, in person. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank Anybody you. else? Um, I'm going to ask you a question, a final question, and it's one I ask most of the artists, and that is, um, what's your favourite artist? What piece of artwork would you love to put on your mantelpiece, uh, regardless of whether we have to steal it or borrow it or something else like that? You know, money, no object. What would it be? Okay, so I had to think about this one, like everybody, I suppose. I, I don't know if I actually have a favourite artist as such, um, but... Uh, a painting that I would do time for would be uh, Frank Auerbach's Study for a Tree on Primrose Hill. It's a tiny little painting. Um, Is it there? That's it, yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's in or around A3. Um, it, is, it has so much in it, and then it has nothing at the same time. The perspective in it. And then I think the thing that strikes me and what I like about this more than anything is the energy. There is an energy. You can, I can nearly hear the wind. It's a, just an extraordinary piece of work. And that would be my choice of, of, uh, of artwork that I would take. Very good. Um, last week, uh, somebody, somebody said that, that I never asked the same question of John Adams last week. But in fact, he really alluded to it himself and it was Francis Bacon. And... Oh. Uh, so just to put that in. <laughs> okay, listen, Gary, thank you so much. You were great. And you gave us a wonderful tour of your, 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 your fabulous uh, studio there, which I think is an amazing place. Oh, thank you very much. And again, thank you for, uh, for, um, for asking me to, to speak. And I hope I've done the studio some justice. And, uh, and, and fair play to you, Alan, for doing what you're doing. Mm. Uh, I think, I'm sure everybody says it, but I'd like to just say, Thank you to you because uh, what you're doing and stuff like that is, uh, um, it, you know, it's great for people to be able to just check in. Yeah, good. Well, well I, I hope it's of some value to, to the artists we've had on. Um, I'm sure it is. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. Thanks everyone for watching from far and wide, from Canada, all over the place. Uh, it's lovely to see. And I know there'll be a lot more watching the video after the event as well. Um, so I, I look forward to your future work, Gary, and see what uh, how your yeah. whole practice develops. Thank you. I'm I'm sitting up in um, Hamley and Hamley in uh, sometime next year. Will um, you? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure when, but uh, okay. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I've been in long grass for a while, so it'd be nice to sort of come out of the long grass. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But, uh, well, let us know that, and we'll put a shout out for you. Great. Thank okay. you. And uh, I'd just like to wish everybody a happy Christmas as well. Yep. Uh, when I have the chance. Yep, sure thing. Yep, yep. And, and for me as well, to everybody. And uh, just as a final note, uh, as if you're not fed up listening to me already, um, I'm going to be interviewed on Sunshine Radio in a couple of minutes, 17 minutes past 11, at precisely 11.35 or thereabouts um, on Sunshine. Now, if you don't have Sunshine, in other words, if you're not in Dublin, because it is a Dublin... Um, a radio station you can actually get the app sunshine radio 106.8 fm uh, or you can look it up on uh, their uh, their website and they have a live feed from that as well so i'm just talking about the book and the art as well and how it all came together uh, it's not a, it's not a very long interview but uh, an interview nonetheless so look out for that if you like all right so merry christmas to everyone see you on the 18th of january and have a lovely time and a safe time in the meantime Take care, okay. everyone. Bye-bye.